It's the uh, biggest event, the biggest blockbuster clash in history, as Barbie and Oppenheimer go head to head. Two titans, unshakable titans by auteurs, coming out in the wake of the biggest action movie of the year. We have our big summer blockbusters to follow up Mission Impossible in a movie about a talking doll and a movie about a man who thinks really hard. Um, so, Connor, <laughs> let's start with the Barbie half of this. And, uh, what is the plot of Barbie? Barbie is starting to have an existential crisis. Thinking about death. Starting to turn more, uh, human-like. And less of the idealistic woman she is. She lives in Barbie land, which is run by the, uh, by the Barbies with Ken's and Alan and all the failed Barbie spin-offs living as second-class citizens, essentially, <laughs> yes. to the reign of Barbie. The Kens live in implied homelessness and only exist to serve the needs of the Barbies. And the ugly Barbies get banished. Yep. Ugly Barbie. Weird Barbie gets banished. And Alan the token gay just kind of hangs around. Alan is the Played token by Michael Sarah, gay. Of course. Um, it's, it's a movie where then Barbie and Ken travel to the real world and Barbie discovers things aren't so great for women there like they are in Barbie land. And Ken realizes that Shit sucks for men. Shit sucks Barbie for men in Barbie land. land, but things are awesome for men in the real world. So Ken and Barbie return, armed with their new knowledge of the world, and they they come along. Well, Ken Ken takes over. The men take over and create the idealized world of like Joe Rogan, basically. <laughs> And, um, along comes Lady and her daughter, who are, who are kind of Barbie's, uh, anchor to the real world, as, as they learn, perhaps neither the real world nor Barbie world were as ideal as once thought. So, Aiden, what did you think of Barbie? Barbie, pretty okay. Um, it's funny a lot of the time. Um, the production design is very good, especially in Barbie Land. Um, I do have some qualms about the dystopian nature of Barbie Land. Like all the Kens being second class citizens who aren't allowed to vote and live in the streets. And then at the end of the movie, you'd kind of think that, like, the Barbies and Kens would cooperate, but instead they just reinforce the matriarchy and the Kens go back to happily living as homeless second-class citizens, which is kind of an odd conclusion and very dystopian of Barbie land. Maybe Ken was a little bit in the right. Not entirely. He kind of overdid it, but it's, it's strange that the movie is pro-segregation in that way. Um, yeah, that's a little bizarre. Kind of an odd, end, kind of an odd ending, that the Kens get forced back into their um, horrible second-class citizenship. Well, they said Barbie Land can't remain the same, and will elect a couple Barbie judges and or Ken judges to so the lower courts. It kind of implies that the Kens to Barbie Land are what women are in real life. Which I understand the commentary at the end. <laughs> I mean, I get it. It's kind of weird. It's cheeky. Um, you would think Barbie Land would end as like this ideal place, but I mean, in reality, it still just has a lot of the problems <laughs> of the real world just reversed. <laughs> yeah. So did the Barbie? It's an odd conclusion to come to to say, man, the real world sucks. Wouldn't it be epic if it was the other way around and someone else was suffering? <laughs> right. As long as I'm not the one suffering. Uh, that's an odd ending. Um, feminist. It's very neo-feminist. 
it's something. Um, the whole Will Ferrell subplot could have just been cut from the movie. It really should have been. Because, like, after Barbie comes to the real world, there's a scene where some guy in an office goes to Will Ferrell, who's the president of Mattel, and says, Barbie's in the real world, and then Will Ferrell and a bunch of nameless board guys run around looking for Barbie, and I get what they're doing, where it's like, even though this is a product for women, women don't have any say in it. But then, that whole group of characters is both nameless and out of the movie for like, the entire middle, and then at the end they come to Barbie Land and say, well, it looks like everything's kind of resolved now. And then, <laughs> they don't have any impact. I mean, Ken is the villain of the movie, kind of. So I don't really know why Will Ferrell and the group are here, outside of one gag about how a company that sells women products for women is run by men. Um, probably could have dropped that whole thing. Um, I like the cast. Uh, Ryan Gosling, especially as Ken, kind of steals the show. I like that for all, everyone else. I like that the hat. Everybody in Hollywood gets to participate in this weekend because <laughs> both Barbie and Oppenheimer have a very star-studded cast down to the C-lister. So anybody you know in Hollywood is in one of these two movies. Yeah, I mean, and if not, they made their way into Mission Impossible. That's, that's what right. I was about to say. If they weren't here, they were in Mission Impossible. <laughs> Ving Rhames and Simon Pegg and, uh, well, Alec Baldwin is nowhere to be seen, but, oops, <laughs> oopsie. <laughs> oopsie doopsie, that's why he's not invited anymore. Uh, yeah, yeah, star seven caps. I like everyone, I like Margot Robbie uh, as Barbie. I like, uh, I like Ryan Gosling's Ken is very funny and definitely steals the show. Right. Um, some awkward conclusions, uh, but a decently fun movie. Also, I think it's worth noting that I got sat next to a group of like eight-year-olds, eight-year-old girls in the theater, and throughout the entire thing they got very confused and bored and started wandering around, uh, which is maybe not the best thing for your Barbie movie to end up as, but I understand that this movie is meant to appeal to uh, art hoes, Tumblr hoes, who move to Twitter and then Threads and then Twitter and then Blue Sky and then Twitter and then Letterboxd. Um, so eight-year-old girls are not the target audience for this Barbie product. No. Which is odd, but it is what it is. Um, yeah, it's decent fun. And Connor, what would you think of Barbie? I thought Barbie was really good. I liked Barbie. I, I didn't think it was perfect or anything. But I thought it was pretty good. Um, for one, this would be a, it's a fun movie to watch with an audience. It's made for the theater. The theater. Yeah, those drunk those ladies drunk, in the back. Yeah, the theater. drunk ladies in the back of the theater were having the time of their lives. Um, little girls were not. <laughs> The little girls next to us were confused by all the dick and poopy jokes and the penis jokes, the yeah, vagina but, jokes. But the drunk 25-year-olds in the back screaming constantly, definitely. Yeah, it was it was a party movie. You know, maybe <laughs> see it at night, because children are just going to be confused during the day and not like this movie. It's not like the Transformers movies where there's like adult themes, but it works for everybody. Yeah. This movie's explicitly made for... This is a Greta Gerwig movie license. <laughs> it's, it is. It's not a movie for children. And it's well done, but yeah. the start did make me motion sick when they were doing Barbie stuff and made me want to vomit. I think you were just drunk. I was drunk in the second to front row, and it made me want to vomit. But then it got better after that. Uh, it, it's a good looking movie. I like the kind of like 60s beach movie aesthetics that they were going for, which I mean, kind of makes sense and works. Uh, there was some hokey stuff like when Barbie becomes a real girl at the end, yeah, it goes to the gynecologist. Yeah. But there's a lot of <laughs> yeah. good jokes. I found myself laughing a lot. 
Yeah, I was smiling fun. the whole time. I had a great time watching the movie. Um, would it translate to repeat viewings? I doubt it. Least of not, unless you're like at a party atmosphere. It's definitely a this movie. This is one of those movies, it's a hangout movie. You throw it on in the background while you're hanging out with friends, and it's occasionally funny. I, mean, I think that's what it's going to transition into once it leaves the theater. Is like, eh, what's something we can throw on and not pay attention to? The Barbie movie is kind of aesthetically pleasing, and it's <laughs> it's fun. It's a fun party movie. So, it, it mixes deep themes that perhaps weren't fully executed correctly at the end. <laughs> but it has, it has themes, and it's a fun party movie. It does what it sets out to do. It does exactly what it sets out to do. Uh, it might have stumbled a bit on the landing for me, but I thought it was mostly good. Yeah. So, Aiden, would you recommend Barbie? Yeah, Barbie, uh, definitely recommend. Um, I think, you know, it definitely has an appeal to some kind of art house crowd as this ironic, weird thing. Uh, it's funny. We snuck uh, it through, ladies. <laughs> it's probably not the best movie for children, because it's weird and... It's bizarre. Uh, <laughs> dry, and, uh, it's funny. Um, I don't, I don't know, the, the kid appeal seems very low, but I did enjoy it, um, and I would recommend it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Connor, would you recommend Barbie? Yeah, I had a good time. Like Aiden said, I don't think the kiddos would like it, but it is kind of a, it's a fun tongue-in-cheek party movie. Um, either watch it on HBO Max and throw on, you know, throw it on the background on HBO Max for a date night or a party night, or watch it in theaters with the crowd. I think as the weeks wear on and Barbie becomes a matinee, Barbie isn't a movie you want to watch alone at 9 a.m. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, anyways... It's a crowd pleaser. It was a crowd pleaser. But speaking of pleasing the crowd, we watched another movie. Oppenheimer. Aiden, what is the plot of Oppenheimer? <laughs> the plot of Oppenheimer is a real life event about J. Robert Oppenheimer, the man who organized and did a lot of work in the creation of the nuclear bomb. And the, um, the first half of the movie is, uh, basically the bomb's construction, and then there's the bomb, and then the second half of the movie is the, uh, metaphorical fallout to that bomb where, uh, the government turns against Oppenheimer, uh, for a decently long period of time, and he has to deal with uh, the guilt and consequences of what he created. So Connor, what do you think of Oppenheimer? I liked Oppenheimer, but I had issues with it. Okay, so here's the thing. For the master of cinema, the man who said this movie needs to be seen on cinema screens, he did a great job of making an Apple TV Plus miniseries, <laughs> chopping five hours out of it, putting it in this rushed somewhat poorly paced movie and throwing it on screen. I do think Christopher Nolan did good in getting good performances out of his actors, which That's a first for him. Is rare <laughs> That's for, a first him. for it, him. It's been a while. We'll say that. <laughs> for a while he's just coasted on the concept. But it felt like here he really focused on the actors and the everybody did great. Everybody under the sun who wasn't in Barbie or Mission Impossible were in this movie. And everybody yeah. was doing great. Even Josh from Drake and Josh was in the movie in a minute role. Dane DeHaan has Dane a minor DeHaan role. Dane DeHaan is in a minor role. Matt Damon plays a supporting You're like, role. This guy hasn't Robert done anything Downey. since he left Drake and Josh in 2007. He gets a minor role. Robert Downey Jr., Cillian Murphy is Oppenheimer, and he's very good. Uh, you got uh, Emily Blunt. 
you got That's Florence Pugh. Pugh. Yep. But there's so much stuff that just feels rushed. Like, I would love to see an episode of an Apple TV Plus miniseries where Oppenheimer and Florence Pugh have their relationship and affair and maybe see some difficulties later in the series on how that affects Emily Blunt and, and, and Florence Pugh's ultimate suicide. Florence Pugh felt really rushed. There was a lot of great actors that got hired for minor roles, and it's like, I want to see what they did in this project. I want to see how they tackled the atomic bomb. I think this should have been a miniseries. And, and, I, and I understand, but it's just ironic to me that Christopher Nolan left Warner Brothers because he wanted to preserve the theatrical experience and then he switches into prestige drama with a lot of layers to it that would perfectly be at home on something like HBO or Apple TV or Netflix or something. Yeah. It feels like a prestige drama that would be on TV. And I felt a lot of the character missing, the characters missing their moment to shine because the movie had to be three hours. But at the same time, there's so much stuffed into it that three hours feels weirdly long if you wanted to make this a movie. So, in a lot of ways, my opinion is this movie either should have been two hours to two and a half hours or should have been ten hours and been a miniseries. But it falls somewhere in between which makes me feel like the first half hour and the last hour kind of lags while there's an amazing hour and a half movie in there. And I felt like the start and the end could have been shaved down a bit or could have been expanded a lot. And I feel like we fall somewhere in between, which is my problem with the movie. The atomic bomb stuff was amazing. The characters were amazing. There was great acting. I either want to see more or I want to see it shaved down so I don't feel like missed potential. Where there's so many characters in this movie that I felt missed their potential because they were undershot. And they should have either just been cut out of the movie or had more done to them. So yeah. this is my... I liked this movie. But it's my most disappointed I've been in a movie all year. Because I just felt like... It sh Christopher Nolan should have went one way or the other. But I will say, I'm excited to see Christopher Nolan's career at, at Universal. Because I feel like Universal won't tell the guy no, for better or for worse. So it's going to be interesting to see what he does. Where Warner Brothers was like, make another Inception. Make another Batman. Because yeah. Tenet felt like... It, I like Tenet. But I Tenet like felt Tenet like, lot, why don't you do something kind of like Inception? Yeah. You know, and, and Dunkirk was like he wanted to get away with something. Dunkirk felt like a prelude, like one for me to get away with eventually make going to Universal and making Oppenheimer. And I think I hope his career at Universal leads to more stuff like this. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing Christopher Nolan go to TV, and I'm not saying that in a bad way because you look at movies like Fanny and Alexander. In, in Europe, it was common since, like, the 70s for people of high stature to transfer over to TV. So, I don't think it should be a, do a knock on Christopher Nolan. Yeah. But I think he should either go prestigious miniseries or just tighten up his movies for the next attempt. I would like but to this see movie, something. This movie has me, even though I wasn't, I'm not as hot on it as everyone else... It really makes me excited to see the future that Christopher Nolan has with Universal or other studios without the grasp of Warner Brothers kind of one for me, one for you type of system. I'm excited to see where he goes, and I like that he's kind of leaving behind the action genre, and I hope he focuses on actors. But Aiden, what did you think of Oppenheimer? Okay, I'm going to have to be a little quick because we're running out of battery because we didn't plan this we, out. We could well. also we just cut it here but. and then charge the battery for like 30 minutes and come back. Yeah. If you have a lot of thoughts, I don't want to um, rush our 300th episode. 
Let me let me see where this goes. Okay. Um, I wasn't really sure what to expect out of Oppenheimer because Christopher Nolan is not historically very good with characters um, or dialogue. Um, and I'm not sure if it was having the historical record to take dialogue from that made this movie much cleaner, but it's definitely a very um, actor-focused movie, which is not usually Nolan's strong suits. Uh, Cillian Murphy is incredible as Oppenheimer, as are... Blinders. <laughs> Scarecrow from yeah. Batman Begins. They've been working together for 20 years. And he's, uh... Can you believe Batman Begins is almost 20 too. years old? Anyways, keep going. Anyway, um, yeah, it's very actor-focused, and I think everyone here is very, very good. Um, there is a structural problem with this movie. The first half keeps up the energy really good, where even in the slower moments, there's this build-up where you have these exciting but mundane scenes where Oppenheimer or one of his fellow physicists comes up with an idea, and there's this excitement around the idea, and it snowballs. And then after the bomb, which is a very incredible sequence. It's <laughs> like three minutes of the movie at most, but it's very incredible. The movie shifts to this kind of courtroom drama where there's, <laughs> there's two court cases going on at once at different times that are unrelated to each other. And it does kind of... Um, the pacing does kind of fall apart at that point, and I still found all that interesting. Like, the people testifying for Oppenheimer, um, and as well as Robert Downey Jr.'s whole uh, big scheme thing falling apart. But at the same time, you, you hit this emotional and action climax at like the dead center of the movie like an hour and a half and then <laughs> the movie continues for an hour and a half like even though I know that the world won't start on fire from the atomic bomb test because um, I'm not dead or I, I was, was born, born. Yeah. Um, there's still just like this incredible tension around the first time of the bomb and that's some powerful filmmaking, and this is very well and made and well shot. I felt my palms getting a little sweaty before they blew up the bomb. My pulse... Even just kind of witnessing the bomb <laughs> yeah. in the eyes of the characters it's, is terrifying. It's weird way. that your pulse... Like, the movie is so well made that even though you know that this happened 70 years ago, you still have this tension build-up to the first time. That's really cool. And then, you know, I, I think the stuff that happens after is interesting. It's just not as cleanly paced as the first half. And I have kind of an awkward suggestion that I was thinking about. Um, Christopher Nolan probably could have benefited from taking a page out of this guy's uh, book. Uh, Christopher Nolan. Uh, I was thinking that this movie could have been structured like Memento where you have, you intercut the bomb being made with the fallout of the bomb, the bomb's use, and then you end the movie at the bomb in the same way that Memento was structured around its thing, like you, you intercut the, the creation and the bomb with this drama around uh, the views of Oppenheimer and then you end with the bomb as this big like this is the this is the moment when everything changed this at movie the end of the could movie. have a real good fan edit I w if I was to edit it I would have ended the movie with Oppenheimer in the gymnasium with everyone clapping and then you see like the yeah. woman start to peel apart and then cut to credits I would have you you do the memento thing, not not the 
the playing things. Maybe start the whole movie with the trial and then kind of like not playing things in reverse. Back. I think you like the trial was was the the framing device, but they shouldn't have started with the trial. They should have either they should have used it more as the framing device and ended with Oppenheimer's yeah. guilt. Well, it should maybe Oppenheimer as I like a my main deal would be the the first and second half of the movie are intercut. So we see Oppenheimer realize that the atom has been split, and then we see a bit of the courtroom stuff. And the courtroom stuff is the framing device, and we go back and forth on that. And I agree with you on the ending point, where the big climax of the movie is the bomb, and then there's a couple minutes where we see the direct aftermath, where uh, Oppenheimer's opinion, after he sees the power of the bomb, he begins to immediately feel guilt and regret about its creation, and I think it should end on that... Uh, speech he gave. I think that would right. be... So I think I think there's a way that this movie could be more interestingly structured, that it doesn't feel like it burns out in the last half. Uh, but despite that, it's a super huge improvement for Nolan as far as being character focused goes, and actor focused, and the storytelling and dialogue and it's probably the first Nolan movie that has actual tangible emotional stakes for real people. Um, even though the only action scene in this movie is a bomb going off in the desert while people look at it. Um, it's an incredible feat of filmmaking and it's really funny that this is like the big summer blockbuster, which is a movie where a man thinks really hard. Right. And then one bomb blows up, and then he thinks really hard, and he gets sad. I think it's really funny that, like, normal people are being tricked into watching this. Um, <laughs> the Barbenheimer meme <laughs> probably helped this movie so much. It yeah. helped. Critically, Barbenheimer helped Barbie and Oppenheimer so much, and probably from a box office perspective, it's going to beat a lot of movie. Both of them are going to beat a lot of movies... That had a week to themselves. I mean, just because this is... I mean... When we were walking out of this movie just like an hour ago, there was a crowd of men and women dressed up as Barbie and Ken walking into Barbie in our relatively medium-sized Minnesota town. I mean, that's the sixth biggest theater in the state. I mean, sure. I only know that it's because I worked there for two years. It's also the I'm done. Being the sixth biggest in Minnesota isn't that impressive of a stat. I mean, no. it's an impressive stat for relatively, but being the sixth biggest in Minnesota probably makes you, what, like the 140th biggest in the country? Hey, Sound of Freedom, we had the second highest stats for the movie Sound of Freedom. I can't even imagine how that's possible. I don't know, it doesn't make Everyone sense. Everyone in the city's Indian except the... <laughs> it doesn't make sense, but it's what happened. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, now we yeah. have drama like Super Mario. Oppenheimer is an incredible feat of movie making. I'm glad that Nolan is improving on his weak points of character and actors and dialogue. Right. Um, it's emotionally resonant. It falls off a little bit towards the end, and I think it could benefit from a more interesting structure. But it is quite the experience. It's incredibly well shot as no one's usually good at. Um, the climax which happens an hour and 20 minutes in is incredible. Um, Robert Downey Jr. The actors are all 10 years. The actors are all incredible. Uh, Robert Downey Jr., Matt Damon, Emily Blunt, for Florence Pugh, uh, Josh <laughs> Peck. <laughs> the fucking was the that scientist, the the one who comes up with the implosion device, is that um, the guy from Good Time? It is, isn't it? Penny Safty? Yeah. 
Yeah, so that was Benny Safdie, bro. I thought it was. That was Benny Safdie of the Safdie Brothers, who's also a Jedi in the Obi-Wan TV show. He is. I like the Safdie Brothers. I was Brothers. like... Yes, it is Benny I was Safdie. trying to place him for, like, a portion of the yeah, movie. Benny and Safdie's like, kind of been an actor in a lot of That's stuff. Funny. Like, he was in one of the Martin Scorsese movies. Yeah, I was trying to place him. He's, like, him. in a lot of stuff. I was like, this guy is so familiar. because Benny Safdie's friends with Martin Scorsese, and then he's, a. Uh, yeah. Him and his brother occasionally make movies. Him and his brother stars. occasionally make Uh, yeah. It's a, uh, really good movie. That's a new direction for Nolan that I like a lot. And, uh, yeah. Good stuff. Connor, would you recommend Oppenheimer? Yes, I'd recommend it. I think it's a good step for Christopher Nolan, even though it's one of my least favorite movies by him. I still think it's a good step in the right direction. I think he's in a new chapter of his career. So even though I thought this movie was a little bit uneven, I, I like where he's going with his career. I hope he works on directing actors and I hope he takes good lessons from this and maybe his career as trippy filmmaker guy is over and he focuses more on historical epics like this and Dunkirk. And I think Universal's gonna give him the keys to the kingdom, so to speak. Here's 200 million, make what you want. And there's very few directors in Hollywood that can do that. Yeah. Namely him and Quentin, Tar him, Quentin Tarantino, Martin Scorsese, and Steven Spielberg are like the four that come to mind that it's like, do whatever you want. Christopher Nolan's And name. I hope he does whatever he wants. Because I, I feel like Warner Brothers really did have an aspect of one for me, one for you. And, and this feels like something he was passionate about. It's kind of a new direction for Nolan. Um, but I think if he works on his craft and figures out what he wants to do more, maybe it's a longer form storytelling of streaming. Or maybe it's the... You know, maybe it's just a matter of tightening up and, and doing similar films, but I'm interested in this new chapter that I assume that I'm guessing Christopher Nolan's going in. So in 150 drunk few episodes or whatever, I'm excited to see what he does next. So Aiden, what are your thoughts on, or, so Aiden, would you recommend Oppenheimer? Uh, yeah, Oppenheimer's good, sick biopic, well made, well shot, well acted. Nothing to dislike, a little bit of structural weirdness, probably but it could have been structured in a way to make it uh, really fall off a little bit towards the end a little less, but I think it's really good, and the one action scene this movie has looks incredible on the big screen, uh, easy recommend for me, and um, yeah. So any thoughts on the Barbenheimer phenomenon while we're here, making our Barbenheimer? Well, when I was working at the theater as the manager at AMC Eden Prairie 18, until I became a plumber, I used to call this Boppenheimer. And I've called it Boppenheimer long before people started calling it Barbenheimer. So I believe in the Boppenheimer way. But we're calling this Barbenheimer for the clicks, but... I think Barbenheimer's better, I'm not gonna lie. It is, but I, I came up with Boppenheimer first and I refuse to let it be changed. Calling it Boppenheimer makes it sound like an Oppenheimer and Big Bop or biopic released on the same weekend. No, you just throw B in front of Oppenheimer, that's, that's what I came up with. Boppenheimer. Yeah, but then it sounds like a Big Bop or biopic. I don't know, what, no one knows what Big Bopper is. I don't he know died in a Bop plane crash with Buddy Holly. And Rick, Richie Martin? Yes. Richie Valens? Yeah. I don't know why I said Richie Martin. No, Ricky Martin did not die. <laughs> Ricky Martin. <laughs> Richie Valens. I mean, I've never heard a Big Bopper song, but I know he fucking croaked when that plane smashed into the mountain. Big Bopper, Big and he was Bopper. fucking turned into liquid like the submarine dudes. Yeah, well, who cares? I don't care. It's Boppenheimer <laughs> to me. What do I think of this Boppenheimer trend? I think it's fucking annoying that people are talking about it. Because I think anything's annoying when they talk about it. <laughs> I mean, it's probably boosted the success. My boss of listens movies. to NPR all day. And they're like, what do you think of Barbenheimer? What do 
you think of Barbenheimer? Do you think a transgressive film like Barbie should be put up against a historical epic like Oppenheimer? Like NPR, shut the hell up. Fuck you, NPR. Fuck you. I mean, the contrast of the movies is funny. It is a contrast. It's interesting. There can we're we're gonna see in the coming days, and it seems like it might be proven. If films are quality, like Barbie and Oppenheimer are, can they coexist? They both seem and to do prove that be doing pretty well. So it far. might be proving to Hollywood that quality over quantity, because this year is big quantity. And I don't think this is one of our worst years. I really don't. Everybody... Not even fucking... There's a lot of crap this year. There's a lot of crap every year. But this has been a fairly good year. But a lot of stuff has come out. And it's like Transformers The Rise of Beasts. I left that theater not remembering what happened in that movie. Two stars. It's all like stuff that's like meh. There's not a bunch of terrible shit. It's just a bunch of like... Hollywood has figured out the MCU formula and a lot, and they just know how to print a Hollywood blockbuster in a week. So every week we're getting a new Hollywood blockbuster, but nothing really quality has been coming out. And now you have two of the highest quality films of the summer coming out on the same weekend, and a week after probably my favorite summer blockbuster of the summer, Mission Impossible. Yeah. And. It brings up an interesting idea of can can quality out outrank quantity in Hollywood, and I guess we'll see. But it looks like the numbers don't lie, and there's a lot of hype behind Barbie and Oppenheimer. So even with the two releasing in one week, I think they'll both find their audience and, and the two have do what they're meant to do. Follow up mission, fucking impossible. Yeah, a week after Indiana Jones, a week prior, and. <laughs> it's just every week shit's coming out. <coughs> so you have two you movies, which I think are the two mo two of, not the two most, but two of the most quality movies this summer. I mean, I didn't love Oppenheimer. I'm critical of it, but it's in a good direction and it's made with quality. I still think there's gonna be better movies this year. Like, Killers of the Flower Moon looks fucking unbelievable, considering it's coming from the mind of an 85-year-old. Yeah, Killers of the Flower Moon looks really good. The fact that Scorsese <laughs> still has it. I mean, Scorsese had it 10 years ago when he did Wolf of Wall Street. The Irishman is might be the most recent Scorsese movie I've seen, and that's a decent movie. Yeah, it's a decent movie with a really, really bad idea stuck in it. Yeah. Which is really <laughs> well done. Did Robert De Niro play like a 19 year old? <laughs> no, they really should have just done different actors, all of The Godfather, but they didn't. Yeah, I don't know. Which was dumb. <laughs> That's the worst part of that movie. It <laughs> looks really bad. See, Disney, Disney's really kind bad. of perfected it where you just get a young guy who has the body of Harrison Ford or whoever 20 years ago. And then you CG the face on. That's the way to do it. Not have 90-year-old yeah. Robert De Niro with a CGI CGI to look 40 but playing a 19-year-old. <laughs> yeah. But then like they'll get a wide shot of action and it's clearly an 85-year-old trying to do these stunts. Yeah, I don't know what they were thinking. See, we've that. set up a world where everything's old. At least in America. All of our movie stars are the old movie stars from 40 years ago because we haven't established new ones. So Robert De Niro has to play a 19-year-old. What do you mean? We have The Rock. We have new movie stars, <laughs> but they're all either failures relatively or MCU stars who can't prove their success outside of MCU. Anyways, Killers of the Flower Moon looks really good. That's my point. Yeah, I'm uh, for that. So I, I don't think the summer is over per se. Killers of the Flower Moon will be But I do think this is the... going to be one of the interesting weekends of the summer. My second Apple TV original movie, Killers of the Flower Moon. Aiden, what are your thoughts After on Bob and Hammer? You got any uh Uh no, I think the contrast is funny and I think the fact that these two very different movies are hyping each other up and creating further success for each other is interesting. 
Uh, but I don't really have a lot of thoughts on the actual thing. Like, it, it's funny. It is. Anyway. What do you think of our 300 episodes so far? We went through like 30 sets. It's been like... We're getting to 10 years doing this. I mean, we started Drunk View officially well, we in 2016. We started Drunk View officially in 2016, but we've been doing new movie chats since 2015. Yeah. New movie chat era was really something. Yeah. Anyway, it's done. We did it. 300 episodes. 300 episodes. Barbie forever. Boppenheimer. Just